Well, welcome. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is actually take two. Um, this, this filming thing is, is a little bit frustrating, but I, I did the whole sermon, uh, went and looked at the camera, and it had stopped uh, towards the end. Uh, and I also noticed at that point that even though it was cut off, I had went 55 minutes. So, um, this is take two. We're going to start over and going to try to uh, not go so extended this time. So, uh, welcome to First Baptist Church, um, virtual church, and um, here we are again, not able to meet, but opening up the Word with you today, and and, and happy to do that, blessed to be able to still do that at some capacity, uh, but really longing for that time when we can gather again. We've We've went a couple different places these last few weeks, has kind of bounced around uh, doing some topical stuff, but I want to today dive back into the Gospel according to John, which is the study we've been doing here for a while at First Baptist. So if you have your Bible, please open up to John 11, and just to catch us up really quickly to where we've been, uh, in John 10, Jesus healed a blind man who had been born uh, blind, he was blind from birth, he heals his eyes, gives him physical sight, and then at the end of that story we saw that he healed his heart and opened the eyes of his heart. Uh, He he brought the new birth into his life. He was born again, and the man there uh, worshipped Jesus on the spot. Pharisees, you know, they didn't really like that that much. They have their issues with Christ, and he began to preach about his unity with the Father, that he and the Father are one, and the Pharisees picked up stones to stone them. Uh, Jesus kind of turns the table on them as he does and then um, escapes being arrested and goes away across the Jordan to the place where John the Baptist had been ministering. Uh, So that's kind of the context of what just took place before this story. Uh, And today we find ourselves in the story of Lazarus, Jesus' friend who has fallen sick. Jesus is with the disciples. They've gotten word that Lazarus is ill, and the last time we were in this text, we looked at verse 4, uh, and it says there that this illness, Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified through it. So Jesus says that this sickness of Lazarus, it won't uh, lead to death in an ultimate sense, in a final sense, because he will live And through His resurrection, the Son of God is going to be glorified. So that's where we've been, and we pick up today in verse 5 of John chapter 11. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. So when He heard that Lazarus was ill, He stayed two days longer in the place where He was. Then after this, He said to the disciples, Uh, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Let's pray. Father, we do come now to your word, and we recognize this is your word, the Holy Scriptures. No mere book, but it is the God-breathed word that is inerrant and infallible. And it speaks to our souls for correction, for reproof, for for. Uh, teaching and for training in righteousness, that we would be thoroughly equipped. So we pray, O Lord, that you would equip us today through your word, that you would reprove, correct, challenge, encourage, Lord, nourish and feed our souls. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, I want to divide this uh, text, this sermon, into three sections or three points. Uh, The first one is an odd response. The second one is truly walking by faith. And then thirdly, it will be the doubter's courage. So we have first an odd response. And I speak here of the, the response of Jesus when he hears that his, one of his best friends is sick. Let's, let's read that again in verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Seems like a very odd response when you hear that your friend is sick. I mean, think about, think about what is taking place with those sisters as their, as their uh, brother falls ill and eventually dies, and they have to go through the whole process of, of grieving and wrapping his body and, and preparing his body and putting him in the tomb. Not only that, but Lazarus literally dies, right? He, he really dies and, and passes from this life to the next. It's as if, you know, you were on a vacation and someone came and said, hey, you're your spouse, your son, your daughter is, is ill, and you said, hey, I'm going uh, to book two more nights at the hotel before I go and see them. Right? It seems to lack compassion. It seems to be anything but loving. Why would he respond in that way? Uh, but I think the first thing we see, reason why, is that God has a plan here and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for these events. And we saw that in verse 4. Jesus says that this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. God has a plan, and part of His plan is that a man is going to die. Now, we know the, the end of that story. Jesus raises him, and that is how the Son of God is glorified. Uh, but, but from the outside, it, it seems that Jesus is a bit indifferent. But we read in verse 4 that, that God has a plan and a purpose. Because we read also in Isaiah 55, when we consider God's plans compared to our plans, which often differ We read this in Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's ways, His motivations, His plans, His purposes, His thoughts, they are loftier, higher than ours. Just as the heavens are above the earth and we look up to them, so are the plans and the purposes and the ways of God. They're they're bigger. He has such a grander, more eternal perspective than our little nearsighted, short-sightedness that we have in this life. And I think we've all seen this played out. If you've walked with the Lord for any amount of time, You know, we pray and we lay our plans before the Lord and He sees things differently. Maybe it was a relationship that you knew. You know, this is Him. This is her. This is going to be the one. We're going to spend our life together. Lord, make it so. Um, Help me to marry this gal or this this guy. And and down the road, it just God had other plans and He steered you in another direction. And um, you thought that was the one. Uh, Maybe it's a a move you wanted to make, to go to another state, to live and plan and do this and to build. Maybe it was a career path and you you prayed, Lord, this is perfect. It's it's all laid out. Just please make it so. But God had other plans. I think if we would have asked Mary and Martha, uh, they would have said it's the worst thing that could happen if Lazarus dies. There can be no good in this. There can be no no blessing of our brother passing away. That's the worst thing that could happen. But consider consider how God uses it. As He brings glory to Himself, points to Himself and who He is. Uh, Imagine that there may be people in the crowds still figuring out who Jesus is. Still wrestling with, is this guy a prophet? Is he just a great teacher? Is he something more than that? 
Maybe there was doubters in the crowd. Yeah, right. You know, these, these miracles he's doing, they have to be phony. Maybe it was Martha and Mary themselves that still hadn't fully placed their faith in Jesus. He says to his disciples, right, I'm glad for your sake uh, that I was not there so that you may believe. Right? So there is faith that is growing in those that see this event. And I'm sure the faith of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, when he wakes up and gets the news, is solidified at that point. So God has a plan and a purpose, but also we see that sometimes God allows trials in our life to reveal Himself to us. God allows trials in our life to reveal Himself to us. I think if we're honest, uh, we would agree that, that oftentimes we are not much different than the Israelites in the Old Testament. Isaiah 48 says, "...because I know that you are obstinate, and your neck is as iron, and your forehead as brass." And we too, right? We can be hard-headed. We can be stubborn. We think that we know what is best for us, that, that we know the best route, that we know the best plan, that we know the best uh, thing that should happen, that God just kind of needs to, to get on board. I think also as people, we can be blinded. Right? We can be blinded by the world, by the flesh, and the devil. We get caught up in the vanity of life, pleasing ourselves, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, just thinking that everything is always going to be peachy. I think thirdly too, as, as 21st century modern people living in a Western culture, uh, we have this kind of foundational uh, principle or, or belief that we operate from that all pain, all suffering, all hardship all toil is bad. That when things are going good, that means everyone's healthy, everything's going my way, everything's easy, I'm not trying hard or fighting for anything. And when, when we perceive things as bad, that's whenever there's any suffering, any toil, any hardship, any roadblocks that get in my way. But time and time again, we see in the Scripture that hardship and adversity is one of God's greatest tools. It is one of God's greatest tools that He uses to shape and to form and to, and to mold us. And He often allows trials that He might open our eyes, that He might say, hey, I'm here. Do you remember me? Did you forget your need for me? Now, I've asked this question many times, whether it be in person or in the Zoom or YouTube or what have you. But I want to ask it again because we find ourselves in such a unique time. How might God be using this, this unique time of isolation and distancing? How might He be using this unique time to form you? Maybe there's something that He's wanting to pull you away from. And He's calling you now to finally and fully and completely lay it down. You've been drawn back and back and back again to that thing. There are small victories, but you've never been able to, to just lay it down. And maybe this change in your schedule and this uh, more time at home has given you an opportunity to, to, for reflection. And you're sensing God's call to just lay it at His feet, to, to turn from it, to repent, and to trust that He's enough. Or maybe He's drawing you into a deeper, uh, in some deeper way to Himself. That as you had time to reflect and as things have been upside down and, and disoriented, you've seen that there are things in your life that get in the way of your relationship with Jesus. There are things that, that God is saying, uh, this, this roadblock, this hurdle, how might God be calling you to a, a deeper communion and relationship and knowledge of Him? Or maybe it says, how is He teaching you to love others and to put them first? Uh, some of us are, are with our loved ones now more than we have been in a long time. And sadly, if you look at the statistics, domestic violence has climbed exponentially during this time. 
People are home, they're getting frustrated, they're, they're butting heads. But how might God be using this extra time together to teach us to put others first and to deny ourselves? Sometimes God allows trials to reveal Himself and to wake us up. And He surely does that here, where He uses the death of His friend to bring faith in His fellow believers and to glorify and point them to His deity and His identity. We see then, secondly, as our story moves on, point number two is truly walking by faith. Truly walking by faith. Uh, I want to draw your attention to verse 7. Uh, then after this, after they stayed two days, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Now, do you hear their, their shock, their frustration, their, their appalled even? Jesus, what do you mean? You know, from their perspective, they barely got out of there alive. Uh, if you look at verse 30, 30 of chapter 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus did not claim to be God. Many try to say that. It is patently false. The Jews knew exactly what he meant when he said that, because in verse 31, they pick up stones again to stone him. They, this is not a rock fight. They want to bludgeon him until he is deceased, until his life is taken from him. And Jesus asked them, you know, what good deed have I done that you might want to stone me today? And, and their response is not any good deed, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. They knew exactly what he meant. But then look in uh, verse 39, again, they sought to arrest him but he escaped from their hands. The disciples are feeling like, Jesus, we just got out of there alive. We barely escaped getting arrested. You almost got stoned right in front of us all. Why in the world would we go back to, to Judea now? It's not safe there. But look at verse 9. Jesus answered them, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus pulls on this old proverb, not a, not a biblical proverb, but a saying from the day. And during this time, the, the, the people in that day would basically uh, separate the day into two halves. You had 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. Now, that wasn't totally accurate, but without a watch and clocks, that was just how they kind of uh, broadly understood the day. And the light, the daytime, that was when stuff got done. That was when you did your work. That was when business and commerce happened. You plow your fields. That was the time to work, to serve, and to do what you needed to do. And when it got dark, they would kind of hunker down in their homes. Family would all come together. Animals would be secured. And they would, they would rest and sleep for the next day. And you'd get up at sunrise. Um, also, there was a, a safety thing. It wasn't that safe at night because that was when uh, people that were up to no good might be prowling around without street lights and, and all of those sort of things. The day was for labor and for living, and night, everything ceased and the work was done. And the idea that he is giving with this proverb is that you cannot lengthen your day, and you cannot take away from it. When the light is here, it is time to work, and no one can take that from you. No enemy can come and, and shorten your day, but you also can't lengthen it. There is an allotted amount of time to labor and to get things done. And Jesus relates this to his ministry and the will of his Father. No one can stop him from doing the Father's will as long as the day has light. It is the Father who sets the agenda, the Father who sets the time, the Father who knows the hour. So people can come up against Jesus all they want. They can seek to arrest him, to stone him, to kill him, to silence him, to incarcerate him. 
but they cannot touch him and stop him while there is day, while there is light left in the day, or while there is still time for him to serve according to his Father's plan. Jesus, we see here, is truly walking by faith. He is trusting in his sovereign Father. And that word sovereign here to Jesus is not just a a Bible word or a theological word, but it is a truth that he lives by. He's willing to go back into this hornet's nest, back into this area where the same men that just wanted to arrest him and kill him are, because he knew that ultimately there is one that is in charge, and it is not the Jewish authorities. There's another man that I've mentioned at times that I've um, brought up in sermons that lived in a similar fashion as Jesus here. He also walked by faith, and his name is John Payton. Uh, He was a missionary uh, in the 1800s. We've talked some about him, but he he had this burden to go to these islands that were full of what they would call at the time savages. Uh, There were people there, and we're talking real islanders with spears and clubs, and they would kill the people that would come to their island. And not only would they kill them, but they would eat their flesh. They were cannibals. And he was told by everyone, you can't go there. It's foolish. You're going to be eaten alive. What are you thinking? Well, he went there, and he suffered mightily for the sake of Christ. But he also was used mightily. And one of the many times that he found himself surrounded by the tribesmen with his life on the line, Uh, There were literally men around him with clubs and spears, and they were egging each other on. You know, you you throw the first blow. You throw your spear. You get that one. Kind of of egging each other on. And he writes in his autobiography um, what happened at that point. He says, My heart rose up to the Lord Jesus. I saw him watching all the scene. My peace came back to me like a wave from God. I realized that I was immortal until my master's work with me was done. The assurance came to me as if a voice out of heaven had spoken that not a musket would be fired to wound us, not a club prevail to strike us, not a spear leave the hand in which it was held vibrating to be thrown, not an arrow leave the bow or a killing stone the fingers without the permission of Jesus Christ whose is all power in heaven and on earth. He rules all nature, animate and inanimate, and restrains even the savage of the South Seas. And this was a man empowered by the Holy Spirit that was truly there walking by faith. Like Jesus, he understood that not a hair on his head could be harmed without permission of Almighty God. He also understood, like Jesus, that God had called him to the work that he was doing and that that work would continue until God was finished with him and not a moment earlier. As I considered the faith of Christ and I considered the faith of Mr. Peyton here, a question came to my mind for myself and for all of us. Is this the type of faith that we are operating with? Is this the type of faith that we live with every day? This sort of bold, true faith that, that this, is, this is faith in action, right? This is where faith becomes not just things we say, but it becomes a reality. Because God has allotted us all a time on this earth. Not just a time to live, but He's also allotted for us all a calling to fulfill. It says in Ephesians 2 verse 10 that we are uh, created for good works, that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is a calling that God has given us all, a, a, a calling to fulfill, to walk in, to be faithful to. But what is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who goes to a foreign land, who plants their flag for the nation that they represent, 
and who builds an embassy. And that embassy is a small representation of the nation that they hail from. And as Christians, we are ambassadors who plant our flag for Christ and for the gospel of the kingdom. We, we build embassies, little representations of the kingdom of God on this earth. And, and we then image our king. We, we represent our king to anyone and everyone. So this church right here is an embassy. It is, a, it is an embassy for the kingdom of God. We've planted our flag for Christ and for His kingdom, and we as ambassadors are His representatives in this foreign land that we're passing through. But also our homes are little embassies for the kingdom of God where we've planted our flags and said, for, for, for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. No one can hinder the work that God has called us to do. You know, I've heard sometimes from Christians that don't, uh, they get discouraged because they don't have a, a specific role. You know, maybe they're not a, they're not a, they don't teach a Bible study or, or head up this sort of, this specific ministry or that, and they feel like their role in the kingdom is not all that significant. But it's the opposite, right? Every person in the body of Christ is, is valuable and necessary. Uh, I know that many in our church and, and many all over have sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and friends that, that need Jesus. Many of them that, that don't want Jesus. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to press into that work. Be to them a, a, a faithful testimony to Jesus, to His grace, to the love that He has instilled in you, to the, to the fruit of the Spirit that He is manifesting in your life. I know some folks uh, that, that just work a quote-unquote normal job feel like, you know, I don't, I don't have that significant of a role. I don't get to minister uh, much often. I want to say to that, that that Christ calls us all to our vocations. It's not just elders and deacons. He places sovereignly and providentially Christians all over, ambassadors for Christ. So let your co-workers, you might be the only witness for Christ that they ever see. Let your light shine before that they might before them that they might glorify your Father in heaven. When you tell stories of the good things that happen in your life, give glory to God. Praise God for His faithfulness. When they tell you stories of their child being healed or, or what have you, praise God for them and, and give God the glory. Uh, maybe you're retired and you feel like, you know, I just, I'm home most of the time. I don't see anyone. Um, God has sovereignly planted you where you are. If you're in a park, you have neighbors, right, that are around you that, that need Jesus. You might have people coming into your home to care for you. Uh, allow your light to shine for Christ. Do they see the hope of your calling in you? Do they see the light of Jesus in you? Are you salty to them? Are you acting as an ambassador? No one can hinder the, the work that God has given us until God says He's done. But secondly, no one can harm us outside of His authority. You see, Jesus believes that as He goes back to Judea. The psalmist says that man cannot harm us outside of God's authority. Psalm 118.6, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? I read this recently, I think, in another sermon. But Jesus says, you know, don't fear him who can kill the body. Fear him who can kill body and soul and send you to hell. Man cannot harm us outside of God's control. Satan cannot harm us. Uh, remember the book of Job? There, uh, God... Uh, gives Satan a measure of ability to harm Job, but every step of the way, it is only what God allows, and Satan cannot do a hair more. Also, number three, uh, deadly pestilence cannot harm us unless God allows it. Psalm 91 and 3, uh, for, we, for He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence no virus can harm you unless God has ordained it to be so. 
No sickness, no ailment, no cancer, no virus can come into your life unless God allows it. And if that is the means with which God has chosen to take you from this life to the next, then there is no escaping it. We cannot run from death. The, day, the, the days of our life have been marked off from eternity past. David says here, they're written in his book, every one of them. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not being faithful or not trusting the Lord if we wear a mask or wash our hands. No, those things are wise in certain situations, and, and you do what you feel is best. But at the same time, we need not live in fear. Right? We need not live in fear that oh, all these things around me, they're, gonna, they're going to consume me. No, God's mighty outstretched arm is protecting His saints, and not a hair on your head can be harmed apart from His sovereign allowance. As Christians, we can truly walk by faith, trusting that the work that God has called us to will be fulfilled and that no enemy can overtake us apart from the hand of God. As our story continues, the disciples, uh, they depart and they go to see Lazarus. And Jesus tells them that, that he has died. Lazarus has passed away. And he says to them there, that for their sake he's glad uh, because he wants them to believe. He sees still some struggles with their faith. So they go back to Judea, and I want to focus on verse 16 for this last point, and I have called it the doubter's courage. The doubter's courage. Remember, there's this fear. Why would we go back to Judea? I mean, we just got out of there. Now, Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. Let us go. And then we hear this statement from Thomas in verse 16. Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, what is going on here? This is, this is Thomas. And what is, what is Thomas known for throughout church history? He's been known as a doubter, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's odd or interesting, I guess, that, that John is the only book that gives us any information about this man, Thomas. Now, his name is listed in, in other Gospels and in Acts as one of the apostles, but only John gives him any airtime. Uh, and he's famously known, of course, for saying, after Jesus resurrected, I will not believe unless I see the holes in his hands, right, and the holes in his side. And then Jesus says, here, he has that famous confession, my Lord and my God. But here we see something quite different. As Thomas has kind of been given this black eye for, for weak faith, we see here kind of this bold zeal just to go and die with Jesus. Hey, if Jesus is going to risk his life, I'm going to follow behind him. And if death is the case, then so be it. But as we see kind of this maybe misplaced zeal from Thomas, Jesus just got done telling them that as long as there is light, as God is still using us, you know, we will not stumble. I think he's really nailed what it means to be a disciple. Because to be a disciple ultimately is to die, right? It's to die to ourselves. I want to turn briefly to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, where we have this, this passage of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Might not be the picture that is put out there um, in, in different circles in our day, but this is Jesus' words of what it means to be a disciple. And he says in Matthew 16, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Now, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. He had not been crucified. But every person in that room knew what it meant to take up a cross. When a person had their cross, and they were walking up that hill, they were going to die. They were going to be executed. And the very tool, the very instrument that was going to be used, they had to carry themselves. So we see here in this text that the call of Christ is first 
a call to follow. It is a call to follow. That's what it means to be a disciple. It means to be a learner. Right? A, a disciple in Jesus' day of a rabbi, they would sit at his feet. Right? There was this humility, recognizing that he's got the wisdom. He's teaching me. I'm under him. So the call to follow means that we heed his instruction, that we walk as he walked, that we emulate him, that we seek to be like Jesus, that we allow his word to speak into our life, that if I have an understanding of something and I read it in the word of God and, and, and it tells me I'm wrong, then I change my thinking. I mean, that, that sounds so obvious, but man, it is, it is not always uh, that plain, it seems like, for believers. But if the Scripture speaks to something that I'm doing or to a belief I have, and it says that I am wrong, then we must allow the Word to correct us. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. It means to walk like Him. It means to submit to His Word as authoritative over our lives, but also to call to, to, to follow Christ is a call to die. It is a call to die to ourself, to deny ourself. You know, the world says you got to live for yourself. It's all about me. What can I get? What can I do? What can I have? Right? You got to make yourself happy because no one else is going to do it. But Jesus says we ought to deny our desires, deny our plans, and deny our own will. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, I believe because our will is, is corrupted. One reason, our will is corrupted by sin. It's broken, right? Our desires are broken and tainted. Jeremiah says in uh, 17.9 of the book of Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can understand it? You know, we sing that song, uh, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And I think we all sense that just just falling away, that, that slip that can happen if we're not daily denying ourselves and turning to Jesus and trusting in Him. But as the Bible so often does, it gives us these kind of paradoxes right, where Jesus says, come to me and die. Come to me and deny yourself. Die to yourself. But thirdly, the call of Christ is a call to die to actually live. To die for Jesus is to live, to finally find life. Because the scripture tells us that we're actually spiritually dead before we come to Jesus, that we don't have life. So a denial of ourself, a denial of the flesh in a turning to Jesus, even though it's a, it's a death of that old person, it is where we actually find true spiritual life. You know, I met a man this week, and I, and I told you about him in the, in the news week, and I want to encourage you to pray for Matthew. Uh, he, he came here through God's providence. He was going to Ashland and happened to stop by. He saw my car and uh, needed a ride, and I just kind of put down what I was doing and, and felt like God had brought this divine appointment. Um, he was a year older than me, uh, had a really rough past, but man, he seemed to know the Lord. He knew the gospel. He knew the scripture. He, he was just reciting all of these verses about his standing in Christ and the grace of God, that, that his mercy is greater than our sin. But he was a broken man. He was a broken man, and, and he did what we so often do. You know, he, he, he knew the scripture. Uh, I don't know the state of his soul, but he was hanging on to the world. You know, the world just had him in his, in his clutches, and he would... He would, he would get on his feet and, and, and good for a while, and then he would fall back into his sin, and he had traveled across the country to come here and found you know, the sin. It'll, it'll find you wherever you are. And he had, just that previous day, um, given away all of his belongings, truck, everything he had to get out of the situation he was in, and he had slept that night next to a dumpster. But I could tell that this man, he, he, he knew in that moment, and I'm praying that it would last, that he had to die if he was ever going to live. He had to put to death all of those things. That old life had to go, and he had to come to Jesus to find life. And isn't that the lie of the enemy, the lie of our flesh, that we can't surrender all, that we have to hang on, that if you actually give it all up, you're going to lose so much. 
you lose your freedom, you lose your happiness. But the scripture says the opposite. Deny all of that. Die to ourselves. Let it all go. And there we find life, joy, contentment, satisfaction, and happiness. The call to Christ is that I think Thomas really pictures so good here is a call to follow him to death. But it is there that we actually find life. Denying ourselves and living for Jesus is actually where freedom is found. And friend, I hope that you know this. Uh, I hope that you've been able to deny yourself, to repent of your sin. And I hope and pray that you've found life in Jesus. Because it is a lie that tells you that you just can't let go. I want to encourage you today. I want to call upon you today to let go. Whatever that thing is that you have been unwilling to surrender, whatever that aspect of your life that you just, you just haven't given to Jesus, that is stopping you from fully knowing Him, from fully walking with Him, and it may be stopping you from actually truly being a believer. You know, being a believer is more than just saying, yeah, Jesus, He is who He said. No, being a believer is surrendering to Jesus. It's hoping in the gospel, giving it all to Him. We don't do that perfectly. Right? No one's done it perfectly. But there's trusting in God that He is better than all of my junk. So to bring this together, we saw initially an odd response by Christ. He seemed indifferent to the sickness of His friend, but we saw that His plan was so much larger and that part of His plan was actually that Lazarus would die. Uh, but through that, many would believe. They would trust in Him. God would be glorified. We saw there that God allows trials in our life to bring us to Himself, to reveal Himself, to wake us up. We saw Jesus truly walking by faith, trusting that God was in control. He was willing to go back into a hornet's nest because He knew that nothing could happen unless God would allow it. And lastly, we saw the doubter's courage. That Thomas in this moment was bold to say, I will follow Jesus to death and may the Lord give us the strength to do the same. We all hope that on that day, if, the, if the, the, the situation came up that we had to choose life or Jesus, that we would choose Jesus. But I think living in America, those chances are fairly slim. But every single day, we have the choice to live for ourselves or to live for Christ. Am I going to die to myself today? and live for Jesus, or am I going to cling on to the things of this world? That is a battle that we must fight daily. May God give us the strength to be faithful, to give all of it away, to love Him, and to love our neighbor. Well, I hope and pray that God has blessed you through His Word. Uh, and as I close, just want to close with a, a benediction, which is just a blessing, God's blessing from His Word, that you might hear the voice of your shepherd. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord.